Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a brand new week. And it's a pleasure to be with you once again. Last week has been a wild ride, hasn't it? First, we tried out the Yoruba language thingy. And I must say, you lot have surprised me. But then, it's something that will be happening with a fair bit of regularity going forward. Because I realize that speaking to you as I am, as effective as it might be, has meant that I'm speaking to the same people. Um, this has become something of an echo chamber where we're speaking with each other. And the people that we really need to be speaking to are being left out of the conversation. And these are the common men and women on the street. Common not in the sense that their humanity is diminished, but common in the sense that they don't have the same level of access to information as those of you who are able to follow what I am saying. So I will be doing a whole lot more in Yoruba language. And even the things I'm doing in English language, I'm going to spend some time and resources and try and see if we can have them translated uh, and subtitled in our local languages because it is actually very important that someone is speaking to the victims because you no longer get to hear anything in the churches or in the mosques for that matter. I'm going to be touching on those two places in the course of our discussion and certainly you're not going to be hearing much uh, from the houses of the botched horu and all of that so religion whatever the manifestation in nigeria has obviously been completely shorn of any content of spirituality so we'll deal with that in the course of this morning's discussion suffice to say that we'll be doing a whole lot in our local languages going forward um, but this morning, I'm particularly interested in speaking to a subject that I have titled Cause and Effect. You know, the Yorubas have these... Um, when, when I started seeing what was going on in our streets, I had a Yoruba phrase brought to my consciousness, and it's the one that says, Tiwamba Fagbu, Bua Fagbu. There is no need for me to waste too much time trying to translate that imagery. Native speakers of the Yoruba language understand that quite clearly. But what he's simply saying is that if you pull on the, I believe, the climber, that's the one, you know, those vines that grows into the tree, when you pull on them, they also pull on the tree limb on which they are uh, Climb on, on which, to which they have climbed. They, they would, when you pull the vine, you pull the tree branch as well. And when you fag guru, guru fagbo, and that's the reality, what has been happening in the last week has been essentially a situation where the victims are reacting to the actions of their oppressors. Um, take your, don't worry, I'll take the time to explain this. Um, in the natural order of things, there's what you call seed time, and then there's harvest time. So if you plant, you will reap what you have planted, because every seed reproduces after its kind. I recall a verse in the Bible, it says that, For the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge cause and effect. Um, the more classic definition is when you look at the doctrine of causality. It says that a thing or event causes another thing or event. The first thing or event is called the cause. The second is called the effect. Sometimes you have ripple effects. What you're seeing on the streets of Nigeria 
save to a very large extent the land of the Oriental brothers and sisters in the Igbo. What you have seen in the last week is a reaction, violently, sad to say, in most cases, to the cause, or shall I say the causes, all rooted in the same thing. Even the silence of Ndibo and their attempt at staying above the fray is in itself a reaction. Let them not say we did it. Let's stay out of it. Let it not be said we are the reason. Let it not be said we started it. So Ndibo has kept quiet. Cause and effect. The northern streets are boiling. Cause and effect. But if I speak about cause and effect, you must understand that there are intended causes and then there are unintended causes. There are intended outcomes and then there are unintended consequences. They are easily foreseeable and desirable consequences, not necessarily desirable to the victim, but desirable to those who initiated the cause. And then there are unintended and undesirable consequences, all of which was never envisaged or expected by those who initiated the cause. Let us attempt to break this down one by one. Exactly what may be said to be the cause. Hmm? What exactly may we say to be the cause? What I have done is to list a litany, outline a litany of what has led us to where we are today. A man comes into office, even if we took the INEC figures as a given, even if we assume that Mahmoud Yakubu is not a cook. I'm using those words deliberately. Even if we assume that Mahmoud Yakubu is saintly and he had acted in good faith and released the original result, and if we accept that what has been given is the real result, it still shows that a larger percentile of the country did not vote for the person who is sat in Asurop today. That is the reality. I am a Democrat, even though I live in an undemocratic environment. Even though I know that the man did not win the election, let me presume to him that he has won. And it is on the basis of this presumption that one might be able to engage. Let us presume that this man won. It does not change the fact that he's sitting there on the basis of the mandate of a narrow minority. This doesn't change that reality. Since he became the president, how has he sought to govern for all? Let me remind us. The president's first executive action was to announce the removal of the first subsidy. Argument for or against that, we can leave to the academics. But we know today, thanks to the quarrel or squabble with Angote, we know as a fact who is receiving our subsidy money. The subsidy that was publicly cancelled was privately resumed. And it was privately resumed. It's up in the air. 
everybody is drinking Malta now. That's in one area. The multiplier effect of that singular pronouncement has meant that costs have literally gone through the roof. Food inflation is about 300% or more in most cases. Some things have become completely unavailable. A bag of rice, 85,000 or 90 in some cases. The man's salary, 70,000. That is what the government has recommended and signed into law. A lot of states are unable to pay that. A lot of private employers are incapable of making that payment. There is a bleak reality out there for a whole lot of people. Begging is on another scale. People who would never ever beg anybody have been turned into beggars over the last one year. The quality of life has become horrible for everybody. In the midst of that, the security situation in the northern part of Nigeria has degenerated completely. When we in the south hear of banditry, what we think of most of the time, because that is our own encounter with banditry, we think of when you're traveling on the highway and you might get kidnapped, or if you're living in Abuja and they walk into your home and kidnap you wholesale. So it's either you're on the road to get kidnapped or you live around Kaduna or Abuja. Those are, that is the impression of the average southerner. But the reality is that the northerner, for him, banditry means he's unable to go to his farm. He's unable to stay in his village. The rural area has been despoilated. Banditry means there is illegal mining going on in which the police, the DSS, the military, the government officials, emirs are complicit. But because of their complicity, is completely abandoned and the Nigerian press is not reporting what is going on. So for him in the north, you've got complete disruption of his way of life. Now here is the thing. The Nigerian press, complicit in the mess, compromised almost beyond redemption, do not report these truths. So the north is left alone. So when we're talking insecurity, we rarely ever speak to the pains of the north because we are rarely ever properly informed about the pains of the North. So here is what has now happened. Because of the unprecedented amount of hunger, the level of multidimensional poverty that has been layered on top of the existing structured poverty of the Northern Odd, what you have today is that for the first time in 37 years, let me repeat myself, did I get that right? The last time the North was involved and was part of a national movement for change was in 1986, 1987, during the SAP riots in the Babangida years. In the immediate aftermath of the SAP riot, the government took a deliberate decision to divide Nigerians along ethnic and religious lines. In the north, Islam was weaponized on campuses to ensure that the northern campuses were unable to respond to national calls for strikes. In the south, fraternities were militarized so that we were unable to speak with one voice in most cases. When issues came up that should unite us, we begin to speak in divis divisive tones and Nigerians were steadily and deliberately divided. Trade unions were infiltrated. Nigerian Labour Congress, the Nigerian Medical Association, Nigerian Bar, every influential trade organization, every collective that used to speak with solidarity, ASU, all of them infiltrated and factionalized just to ensure that they were unable to speak with one voice. So the North has never, since 1987, 
been part of a national movement for change. All that has ever happened is that the people in the north, the common men, were weaponized and used to maintain the status quo. So every time there was a national movement for change called out in the southern part of Nigeria, where the pains of the victimization of the system are largely felt, what tended to happen was that the south would be speaking in one way, the north would be speaking in another way, structured to be like that, systemized and maintained since 1987. In recent times, I've had occasion to speak, and I have said, I think about four or five years ago, that until the North is ready for change, Nigeria will not change. The North is ready for change now, but the leaders of the North, are they ready for change? This is a call out. This is a call out because when you leave a people devoid of purpose, what you find is the chaos and anarchy that we have witnessed on northern streets in recent days. I would explain. Once upon a time, it was the politicians who harmed and maintained the mobs and directed them to purposes. And then there were traditional levers of powers that also could mobilize these mobs on the street. And then there are the madrasas, the sheikhs and imams. Today, cause and effect. All these levers were largely pressed into service in ensuring the emergence of Bola Ahmed Tinubu as president of Nigeria in fulfillment of the many lies that have been told to the people that religion would somehow evaporate our problems. In forgetting completely that God has left the governance of this heart to the sons and daughters of men. It is up to us to fix our country. Saudi Arabia is not less Islamic than Nigeria. Look at Saudi Arabia today under bin Salman. Look at Dubai. They are Muslim countries. Look at Qatar. Those are Muslim countries, but it hasn't stopped them from progressing. Every country develops on the back of hegemonies. What has the hegemony that produced Bola Ahmed Tinubu done for Nigeria? We've destroyed Nigeria. That's essentially what has been done. That hegemony as members from across the length and breadth of Nigeria, I'm not suggesting that it's a northern thing alone, but the northern prerogative is real. We cannot pretend that it is not there. It is there. But what has it done? What you're seeing on your streets, your inability to speak to your people, is because you are the ones who have sustained the lies to the point where you are hurt today and it's almost impossible for you to now tell them the truth of what will bring back peace to the North. But I'll suggest a few to you, if you will allow me to. Peace can only be guaranteed by justice. Justice can only be guaranteed by equity. Equity can only be guaranteed by love. Each and every one of us must embrace this doctrine and understand very clearly that if we sow storms, we will, read, we will reap exactly whatever it is that we have sown. All right, so now we have a precedent. In the midst of crippling, grinding, biting inflation. The President and the National Assembly voted 21 billion to renovate, hear me, renovate the Vice President's house. 70 billion Naira was voted to the National Assembly members to buy SUVs as 160 million naira for each one for senators and House of Reps members. 
4 billion naira was voted to renovate Dodan Barak. Another 3 billion for Aguda House. 5 billion was given to the Presidential Task Force. A task Reform Committee. Less than 20 members. 1.5 billion was given to purchase cars for the First Lady. An office unknown to our Constitution. Judges for job well done got 300% salary increase. I'm not complaining, no. I'm not saying judges should starve. Five billion was budget for presidential fleet. At least one repo, they will buy fuel now, have you? <laughs> Every senator gets 21 million naira monthly. Mm. No, don't worry. I didn't forget the reps. 13.5. This government voted it. We are going to be spending 15 trillions to pave the road with gold from Lagos to Calabar. And your president's friend is the one building the road, Uncle Chagori. Yeah. Unlike when they used to go to Mina, if they wanted to speak with the occupiers of Vassal Rock, these days they go to Uncle Chagori in France so that he can speak with his friend, the same one who gave him the road. And yet, we are told to calm down. We are told to calm down. Where is the money taken from the subsidy? If you say there is no more subsidy, but then we now know that there is subsidy. When you take all of this together, and you then factor in the multidimensional sufferings of the victims of the system that would allow all of these, you can then begin to have an inkling, an understanding of the anger that you are seeing on the streets. Hopelessness births chaos. Hopelessness births chaos. Give the people hope. It's not about letting the poor breathe because they certainly aren't breathing. You've choked them. But give them hope. Not illusion, hope. Hope, real hope, substantive hope. Give them hope. Let them have a basis to believe that tomorrow will be better than today. Show by your own example that you still believe that we should be tightening our belt. Tighten yours as an example. Let them see it. But then you are incapable of doing any of that. But like I said, cause and effect. But here is the issue. For those of us who have no other country to flee to, and I say that full chested, I do not have the residency of any other country aside from Nigeria. I might have visas to travel back and forth, but I do not own a home outside Nigeria. I actually do not even have a foreign account that is operative as we speak today. I opened one, I think, in 2010 in Houston. But I have not operated it since 2010. I think I have a, maybe less than $100 in the account. I'm sure they would even have closed it by now. That's the only reason I can't claim that I don't have a foreign account. I'm all in. This is my country. I'm not running anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm not interested in seeing it born. But if Nigeria is not going to burn because there is cause and effect, the impunity by which our ruiners have operated, the horrible way that they have responded to the pains and sufferings of the people before they went on the street, sent traditional rulers with marching orders to be telling people they mustn't protest, they're protesting because they have no choice. Send thugs as a reader fat monkey. Send that one to be threatening people. In Lagos, one that they call Sego is the one that is busy threatening them that they mustn't protest. 
the Nigerian Christian com Christian Church. Then the, the, the Nigerian Church. Oh, shame on you all. Oh, yeah, sorry. There are one or two exceptions. It would be unfair to Pastor Sam Aedogon, for instance, to count him amongst that number. Shame on you all. There are exceptions. But shame on you all. You can't speak to demand justice before this mess broke out, and you have no credibility to sue for peace. You have no credibility because you are part and parcel of the mess. And that goes for you, the Muslim clerics as well, and even more shame on the traditional religionists. We can't even find one of you who will come out and speak against the abomination to which your, your spirituality, quote and unquote, has been pressed. Then the police came out, issuing threats, left and right. Muslim come out, and it's a democracy, quote and unquote. These are not the responses that brings peace. These responses brings no peace. Where are the elders? How come there is no body who can sue for peace? No credibility. Because it, those who should sue for peace have become part and parcel of the problems. I look at our traditional institutions, shame on you all. Barring, which one of you have actually spoken out in a manner that will give you respect amongst the people? That they will be able to understand that you are touched by the pains of their afflictions and on the basis of the relativity of that, they might listen to you whilst you speak to those who have Cause this problem, but then you are all part of the problems. So traditional rulers can't speak to the people. Politicians, we don't even have any of those. But the ruiners have become so discredited that none of you can actually make appeals. And the president, Yaolundu, speak is not saying anything. The only thing that is issuing forth from government threats, the army busy threatening people. Who is paying who? If we're in a dictatorship, you guys should just say so once and for all. Let us know that our country is gone. If it's a dictatorship, let's know whether it's a military dictatorship or that of Bulaba. There is no point in lying to us that we're in a democracy. You are living like pashas, living as though money is not an object. Burning money up and down the place, living like royalties, like Arabs. Like Arab royalties, meanwhile, the people are living in poverty. You have like 20 million children strolling on the street and you don't expect them to loot when you force them to the street? That was always a tragedy foretold now. Like 20 million of them, you don't even have an accurate census of how many of your children under 15. United Nations last estimate was 16 million of our children under 14 years old. Because when they say somebody is outside school, out of school children, they're talking about people in that age bracket. They are slapping the street. If I don't know what the ones up north are doing, I know what the ones around Jack Ondi and Co are doing. Every time there is any sort of demonstration or protest, they get violent because it's an opportunity for them to steal. It's an opportunity for them to get to do what the government and everybody else is doing still. So they grab it. When you now factor in the unemployable, untrained, it is the children you refuse to train that we sell the houses that you have built. You talk about them removing rail track, condemn, and are condemn. It's because you fail, you fail to train them. They don't hone that. They don't believe in the ownership of that thing. Has been. They don't believe in the common ownership of any common wealth because they know there is no common wealth. You steal everything. So, for them, the protest is an opportunity to get some for themselves. The same way you, the government, is getting it for yourself every day. So they do not believe themselves to be doing anything wrong. They have merely taken their cues from you. 
And that is what you're seeing. It is the beginning of the end. The system is telling you that it is unsustainable. And it is demanding of you that people of goodwill should step up and speak. If you're speaking to the mob, the mob has leadership. If you can speak to the mob, then you can speak to the oppressors of the mob, the government, to find a solution to the mess into which we are all being dragged. I have never believed that our situation can be resolved by protests because we do not have listeners in government. They are deaf and dumb. But the protests are started. I have no single word of condemnation for those who have decided that their only recourse is to protest. They tried doing it with their votes. Their votes didn't count. Okay, so elections are over. Who is not feeling the pain now? All of us are feeling the pain. All. Bulaba, Batidiots, Articulated, Obedience, uh, Revolution, everybody is feeling the pain. We all go to the same market. Yoruba, Ibo, Awusa, Fulani, everybody is feeling the pain. So you've managed to unite the people with hunger. The genie is out of the bottle. Remember I told you, this is the first time in 37 years that the North has been part of a national demand for change. You know that revolution I always told you was coming? is upon you. You thought you quelled it in 2020. You didn't. You can't kill it. The fact that you killed so many people in 2020 actually guarantees that it will not die. You've shown the people how far you are prepared to go in order to thwart their demand for change. Two years, uh, four years later, we're back here again because the human spirit instinctively rebels against inequity. The way you've captured the whole country, rendered all of us as slaves, divided us along religious and ethnic lines so that you continued your stealings, is done. What are you going to promise them again? Muslim, Muslim ticket? You've given them. What are you going to promise them? Yoruba presidency? You've given them already. In fact, Sunday Bo has shown us the lie of Yoruba nation. So there are so many reasons to be thankful to President Bola Metinobu. Oh, there are many reasons to be thankful to him. Because of him, everything has become open, plain, and clear. The fraud of Yoruba nation as propounded by the likes of Sunday Bo has become obvious. It's become pretty obvious. The lies of the competence of the master planner it's become obvious. The inability of North and South to collaborate in any effort for change has been proven a lie. Hubris. Hubris. The overreach of the system has resulted in the hubris that we're witnessing today the overage of the system has battered where we are. For there to be peace, I repeat, men and women of goodwill would have to speak to the street. Let me do my own part, even as I bring today's sermon to a close. Nigeria is not a democracy. You are not citizens. Our country is ruled by impunity and not by law. However, for you to remain human, 
justice must prevail in your space. It is the absence of justice, in this case, economic justice, that has driven people onto the street. It is your right to protest. The silence of the lamb victimizes it. If the lamb would cry, even as the dog barks, men would think twice about slaughtering it. The silence of the lamb victimizes it. Do not be silent. This venal class have no problem whatsoever with turning all of us to slaves if we would keep quiet. The churches, the mosques, the traditional rulers, they are complicit. Your right to protest is guaranteed even by the fraudulent constitution by which they have enslaved us. But please, I beg you in the name of the Almighty, however you worship him, please, I beg you, refrain from an embrace of violence. Articulate your demands, be unyielding in standing behind them. But please, I beg you, avoid violence. The system profits when you embrace violence, and the system prefers that you embrace violence because in your embrace of violence your struggle is delegitimized and you are silenced please avoid violence i bless you i feel a beautiful week ahead and yes end bad governance in nigeria is a plague it is an abominable plague and I repeat my own position. Our electoral system must, must be reformed. The judiciary must be restructured and overhauled. And we as a collective must do better. Our reality stinks and we owe our children much better than what we have done. Cause and effect brought us to where we are today. What the government had done in the past, what successive ruiners of Nigeria have done in the past, is what has brought us to where we are today. Cause and effect. We can reverse it, but we must admit to it and then walk to the change. God bless you. Have a beautiful week. Stay committed, stay rugged, and don't be found wanting.